Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Narup Sathay and I'm the founder and CEO of The Digital Economist, which is a global impact platform focused on building the products, knowledge and the services towards a human-centered global economy. And we have a fascinating panel today. We're going to be talking about all things uh, deep tech. Um, we have folks joining both from Europe, also on this side of the pond from, uh, from the East Coast, including myself. And super excited to dive into it and how timely it is. And I think um, as the next week uh, promises to be uh, a key driver for the global agenda, the World Economic Forum's um, annual meeting, um, as is postponed from, from January, is happening. So kind of makes it all the way more timely. Um, so with that, I'll just invite the panelists to introduce themselves for a minute or two. Maybe we can start with you, class. Sure, happy to do so. Thank you, uh, uh, Navroop. Um, yeah, Klaas de Boer, Dutch national, living in the UK, have been here for 25 years coming up. Um, physicist by training, started working live with McKinsey. Last 15 years uh, was with a family-backed venture fund, so backed by a European family business, with a, uh, I think most people would say, an eclectic portfolio of investments. Um, I left them a year ago after a change in strategy, and I'm currently uh, still involved, but uh, in an independent capacity in a number of the former uh, portfolio companies. I'll, uh, I'll highlight three here, and we can see where we go with conversation. I'm chair of General Fusion, a Canadian fusion energy company, uh, been involved with that business since 2009. Um, and I think an excellent case study if one wants to talk about uh, deep tech. I'm also chair of a small British enlisted company called Xeros, uh, where we are working on making clothing more sustainable with a number of technologies. I can go into that as well. And then thirdly, I'm a non-exec at SmartCam. SmartCam develops organic semiconductor materials for the display industry based in Manchester, UK, uh, but recently listed on the OTC market in New York to tap into other pools of capital than were available here. And in addition to that, I have a few outside roles. I'll, I'll mention one of them, and that is that I'm on the investment committee of Future Fund Breakthrough. This was a fund set up by Rishi Sunak, the chancellor here in the UK last summer, 375 million uh, direct co-investment fund to invest in late stage deep tech companies uh, with a research base in the UK. This fund invest in rounds of a minimum size of 30 million pounds and can do up to a third of those rounds uh, with a dual mission uh, or dual purpose. There's a clear policy goal here to keep uh, science-based businesses uh, independent in the UK for longer. Uh, but at the same time, there's a very clear return goal for this fund. Great. Thank you for sharing that, class. Uh, Natalie, we'd love to invite you to introduce yourself next. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Navroop. Uh, good to be here. Um, it's, um, I think it's my uh, fifth harasses, uh or more, <laughs> actually. It's good to be back. Well, and I'm proud at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But it's always good to come back because uh, uh, Frank really knows how to push our boundaries of comfort zone to talk about things, you know, outside of the, um, let, let's say, on the edges of what we do. <laughs> um, and I, I think it's a, a very uh, stimulating uh, activity as well and then meet new people. I will focus on the, on the current activities that I'm uh, busy with currently. So my name is Natalie Samovic, Latvian by uh, nationality, uh, very much European by the scope of work and the uh, residences um, and the uh, and travel. Currently, I'm in Brussels um, after a long delay getting here. So um, um, trying to be on the uh, sustainable uh, and low carbon footprint uh, travel, mm -hmm. <laughs> i.e. trains. <laughs> so um, without further ado, so I'm uh, busy with uh, three um, main areas within energy transition uh, for the past uh, uh, 12 years. <clears throat> One is uh, related to uh, um, sustainable or green uh, hydrogen uh, development. Um, 
so this is the most recent area but it's organically grew from the uh, both development and innovation and uh, recently a focus on the manufacturing for the solar cells and uh, uh, modules um, so the solar is uh, is the kind of uh, uh, the strong uh, hold and uh, the very beginning of things uh, um, more than 12 years ago we designed and developed uh, uh, Europe's first shared renewable um, infrastructures platform, um, which um, was um, some awards nominated uh, new business model actually uh, in action. And from that, we were engaged also in a lot of European uh, search and innovation projects um, that bridge uh, the, um, the generation and uh, the digital models. So the digitalization came from my earlier background in, uh, in ICT. Um, and so we fused those two areas and out of it, a number of spin-offs uh, came up. Um, some in the uh, more technical ones and uh, some like the uh, uh, smarter school, which is on the bridge between the smart buildings, um, education, um, uh, digital twin of the public uh, uh, sector and uh, um, and the conventional, um, you know, actuation <laughs> IoT related uh, uh, models and the and the platforms. Um, on the policy side, I'm uh, active within two organizations. One is the European Strategic Energy Technology Plan at TIPSnet. Um, and uh, there I'm chairing working group on grids. Um, and that's where um, actually originally from where the the uh, the vision 2050 of the european decarbonization uh came from um there's a group of 300 uh, experts and um so that's the the initial policy work is uh, is done there um great to be part of it and uh things are not done <laughs> we are very busy uh, with a lot of additional topics there and the last one i will mention is uh european alliance of iot innovation um and this is um, um european industrial association um and there i'm chairing working group on energy and that's where the digital side comes together and the deep tech comes together with um energy transition Thank you. Wow, what a what an impressive uh, portfolio here, both Klaus and, and Natalie. Um, so much to uncover and explore, and we'll do that in a minute here. Um, so, welcome. Um, we'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about your background and what you're focused on. Sure. Yeah, and uh, thanks so much for having me here, and thanks to the organizers. It's great to uh, be back at Horasis, and uh, yeah, still um, trying to figure out the number of Horasis meetings that uh, uh, we've had during the pandemic, but uh, really good to be back and hopefully we can be back in person um, uh, maybe this time next year. Uh, yeah, so my name is Rob Sinha. I'm a partner at Longevity Vision Fund, which is the largest longevity focused venture capital fund uh, globally. And we're investing in late stage and clinical stage biotech companies with frontier biotech um, platforms that can really uh, extend the healthy human lifespan. So we're investing across therapeutics, medical devices, diagnostics, AI and drug discovery and drug development, gene therapy 2.0 and 3.0 that can really cure uh, and create these curative therapies for uh, genetic um, genetic defects that could actually you know, um, be really fatal uh, and really changing the way that we all expect to live and uh, function as humans going forward and making it possible for us to live to maybe 100, 150 uh, and beyond and make it even up, uh, and make it possible that uh, we can choose how long we want to live and um, uh, really, uh, that's uh, in our control and, and up to us now. Um, so yeah, really familiar with deep tech in the biotech space, how a lot of that is uh, developed, how a lot of that is regulated and seeing that from a bird's eye view, um, very involved with our portfolio companies. So 18 portfolio companies now spanning regenerative medicine, stem cells, as I mentioned, uh, genetic medicines, AI and drug discovery, um, so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, really exciting to see where innovation is going and this new field of longevity, um, really treating aging as a disease and, and something that we treat all diseases simultaneously rather than treating cancer or autoimmune disease or uh, neurodegeneration or Alzheimer's or dementia. All individually, we can actually address all of them um, with innovations in longevity and aging. Uh, so yeah, great to be here and uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Fascinating. Well, I think for the audience, it's pretty clear we got a lot of deep tech going on here. 
um, a wide range, I think. Um, and it's fascinating for me, um, I think personally, because uh, I come from an innovation economics background. So looking at the IP markets of, of, um, of, of tech, of deep tech, cutting edge tech, and how do you define value when uh, markets don't exist uh, for, for certain products and our services and when you see that, that much of the frontier. So I think what, I, what would be fascinating and interesting uh, and useful perhaps um, is also for us to perhaps talk a little bit about what deep tech means for you. So maybe that's something um, the panelists can take a stab at just maybe um, two minutes or less um, uh, for, for each. Uh, how, do you, how do you define deep tech to kind of come to that common understanding of, you know, uh, what we're looking at here. And, and I think it'd be interesting to go a little bit deeper into the paradigms and, and how to develop and then also um, invest uh, deep tech in a, in a socially responsible way. So we'll get into that in a second. Um, yeah, Klaus, if you want to start, maybe we can go in the in same sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, circle here. Sorry, was briefly distracted by someone else popping up and disappearing again. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there are many different definitions of deep tech, I think. But when I think about deep tech, I, I normally think about um, <clears throat> technology that is based on defensible intellectual property patents, typically, uh, and, and, and typically involves um, physical product. Um, and uh, the combination of uh, those things, and in particular physical product, uh, means that you deal with supply chains, with manufacturing, with manufacturing scale-up. Um, and that means that the way you develop a business is, is quite different from sort of your next uh, B2B SaaS business, uh, where scale-up is, is very much uh, sort of understood and, and predictable. Uh, the moment you deal with physical product and supply chains, um, I've been in a, in a med tech business where we used um, very, very specific lasers. And in order for us to scale our business, we, we needed to help fund our supply chain to, uh, to scale our business. And those are things in, in, in software you don't see. But for me, those are the key elements, um, patent protected, uh, and, uh, and and physical product coming together to deliver uh, innovation. Um, and sort of if, if I take Future Fund Breakthrough uh, as an example, what, which invest in deep tech, uh, the areas that, uh, that come up there are around uh, quantum computing. Um, I know that fusion energy would fall within that scope. Um, there is uh, quite a bit of activity around space technology uh, in that area. But then also, uh, sort of, uh, cell and gene therapy uh, fall within that scope. So it's not just the, um, uh, the let's say, the, some areas of, of biotech uh, fall within the definition as well, but, but uh, not everything. But looking at areas where, uh, in, in this case, the UK, uh, can potentially build uh, a sort of a leading cluster of, 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 of businesses and, and a knowledge base that is sustainable over a longer period of time. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, Natalie and Sarah, what do you, how do you guys define deep tech? Sure, Natalie, go ahead. Natalie, you might be on mute. Yes, Sarah, do you want to go next since uh, you've been already tagged into the sure. classes? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so, so definitely a lot of ways to uh, define deep tech these days. Um, and one of the definitions that uh, I think really aligns and um, is congruent with what I'm seeing in the, the markets in the world today uh, are technologies that are leveraging Moore's law, right? So that's the, uh, the law that technology is evolving exponentially and not linearly, um, and being someone who uh, participated in the Global Solutions Program of Singularity University and uh, Ray Kurzweil, the Mandis' University, really a think tank in Silicon Valley, really understanding, number one, what these exponentially evolving technologies are, number two, how we can leverage them and really leverage them and direct them in a way where we can uh, solve really global uh, grand challenges and, and problems for billions of people, not millions of tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but actually billions of people who 
globally, and then really understanding how to regulate them and and uh, develop them sustainably, so we can create a great future that uh, uh, leverages these technologies and um, uh, provides their benefit uh, all over the world. And these include technologies like AI sensors, um, uh, as you mentioned, cell and gene therapy and advanced manufacturing, uh, gene editing, where we have these tools and all these technologies that. Uh, you know, just five years ago or 10 years ago, uh, this wouldn't have been imaginable, right? So things like CRISPR and, and um, uh, genomic editing tools where just five years ago, if a child was born missing 10 base pairs of their genome, they wouldn't live to see their first birthday. Uh, but today they can go on to live a completely healthy life and not even remember the time when they were actually a patient uh, being born um, uh, with that genetic defect. Uh, so yeah, really exciting times that I think we're, we're living in. Um, and deep tech is going to continue to play a larger and larger role uh, in all of our lives. And if we can get that uh, developed correctly, it'll, it'll create a, uh, a great future for all of us. Thank you. Yes, maybe to um, a lot of things were mentioned, uh, rightfully so, uh, focusing on the uh, two, two, two areas, actually three areas that I already um, went over in the um, in the solar. So um, deep tech is uh, is is now focused on the next generation solar cells, uh, specifically um, um, heterojunction, uh, perovskite, um, and the tandem cells. So that's that's our <laughs> area of deep tech. But uh, um, uh, uh, rightfully, uh, as mentioned by Surav, uh, it's also linked to the advanced manufacturing because this is the high um, hybridization of uh, um, actually producing new generation of the machinery for those technologies. Advancement in the chemistry, advancement in uh, advanced manufacturing, um, and um, sensor technologies, uh, 5G, um, AI ability, you know, to implement the self uh, uh, learning on the uh, factory levels and applying the new models to understand the technology deeper. Um, so if I if I have to put one word on it, I, I think it would be a hybridization of various areas of uh, deep tech and, and 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 not just focusing on one technology. The um, if we take the uh, um, green hydrogen production, then it is hybridizing the sources of um, uh, green electricity with the technologies of um, like electrolyzers, right? Like advancement in the uh, in the membranes, uh, um, which is linked with the material science, which is the deep tech there. So I think it's, it's another area where at least two, three uh, layers have the complexity. And let's add the digitalization in energy, because in order to optimally produce uh, green hydrogen, you need to source green electricity at the right hours in order to enable the, the machinery. So uh, you, you see, so that's another area, and I could not single out one, uh, but it's 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 a lot of those together. Um, and if we look at the uh, consumer level, um, uh, also the scaling up of uh, uh, things uh, related to the flexibility of demand in energy, for example, um, do we call it deep tech or do we call it pervasive tech or do we call it uh, 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 just, you know, hybrid complex tech? Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's another area where a lot of components that need to be put together and maybe we do not need to reinvent and really, you know, um, um, focus on on pure technology, but putting those things together, um, uh, linking interoperably the platforms and uh, and solutions devices, and getting the consumer um, interest in using the systems. Uh, that's the also deep tech challenge. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, fascinating. I think there's a lot to unpack there. Well, I'm learning a lot in this session. That's for sure. You know, one of the things that keep popping in my mind. Um, as the panelists here were uh, kind of sharing your own definition of uh, deep tech in your own industry uh, is um, narrowly kind of triggered by something you said about hybrid technologies. And I thought of, well, you know, the convergence of different technologies, right? And, and, and that's um, a big thing, the convergence of, uh, again, you know, traditional or well-developed technologies with emerging ones. Then you look at emerging technologies sort of um, converging, uh, let's say like I work in AI and blockchain and, and you know, 
uh, we're looking at a very fascinating set of topics there and how that intersects with uh, sustainability. Um, but also, you know, I can't help but think about transhumanism, where there's sort of the human, you know, uh, aspect and biology intersects with uh, with technology, and that's really starts to get into the more sci-fi domain very quickly. Um, so I think I'll kind of throw in my hat there with sort of definition that what all I guess um, is in the scope of, uh, of deep tech. But um, it's fascinating because um, I think uh, two years ago when we launched the Digital Economist at the World Economic Forum, we really set that out as the as a mission of the organization, which is driving convergence of different technologies towards a human-centered future. So I think I'd like to switch gears a little bit towards that. And all of you have alluded to that in sort of one way or the other. How do we build technologies that are responsible, um, that uh, you know uh, are inclusive, um, and and particularly in in the domains where which you know I think a lot of the um, common um, I guess non experts uh, in the domain wouldn't really know a lot about if if you may right so uh, very quickly we get into um, very specific areas of expertise so I think the challenge of explaining the technologies. Uh, to sort of the general audiences and public is is a big one. Um, so I think, um, yeah, maybe Natalie, I can I can ask you how do you sort of go about doing that? What is your um, take on how do we build responsible tech when you know it's hard to sort of have that conversation at I guess the same level. Um, again, I have a lot more to say. In sort of the skepticism and sort of the erosion of trust we have seen over the past years. Um, in sort of public institutions, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about policy towards the end of the session. So yeah, over to you, Natalie. Um, you touched upon the uh, one of the biggest challenges, actually the two challenges, the acceptance uh, and, and, and the trust, um, and the role of the policymaker is actually to probably mend and bridge uh, uh, those. Um, I will use two examples. One comes from the energy transition and decarbonization in uh, um, in the mobility sector, for example. <clears throat> so uh, um, we won't be uh, able to exponentially add the, uh, uh, the 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 EVs to the grid and uh, also the renewable generation uh, capacity. Those need to communicate with each other, and the consumer needs to use the tools to um, manage flexibility, basically. And this is one of the big challenges that we're solving in, in, in Europe uh, on the policy level, on the consumer acceptance level. Um, the conclusion <laughs> so far is it has to be simple, it has to be equitable, um, and it has to uh, appeal not only uh, towards the pure financial benefits to the consumers, but also other values that they um, aspire to. So such as carbon footprint, such as sustainability um, and, um, you know, regional impact, community impact uh, and things of this nature. So this is one of the uh, uh, answers, uh, but it is an ongoing exercise, both on the research level within the horizon <clears throat> program and as well as on the as, as a policy dialogue. <clears throat> so this is one example. And the second example uh, specifically related to um, um, solar uh, solar manufacturing. Um, big drive is uh, is on the uh, sustainable um, production circularity. Um, models um, <clears throat> and um, these topics uh, permeate towards the um, the consumer um, and as well as the B two B. So, for example, um, the developers of the um, uh, projects um, are asking for the products with the low carbon footprint. Um, produced uh, uh, without the use of the uh, slave labor and ethically. Um, as well. <clears throat> and uh, um, on the European level, the policy is also responding to this. Uh, and so this is the, um, you used very good words, so it's not hybridization, but the convergence, right? So this is one of the examples where the uh, uh, some of the policy measures on the eco-design uh, and sustainability uh, fuse with the demand um, and as well as with the uh, uh, manufacturer's uh, drive on it. 
there is many more, <laughs> but I yeah. will stop here. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. I know we can talk about this topic for a lot longer. Um, so did you want to go next and uh, talk a little bit more about maybe elaborate, uh, double click on what you already spoke about the uh, responsible way of developing these? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, I think you touched on a, a really important uh, topic here where we have all these amazing technologies and they're rapidly um, and exponentially growing. And we now live in a world where, you know, cars drive themselves and rockets can launch and, and land themselves and uh, recurring diseases never thought possible. Um, so how do we really harness these technologies in a sustainable um, and responsible way to uh, really solve uh, the right causes and, and not uh, redirect them towards uh, almost nefarious causes? And there's always going to be those groups that um, you know, will leverage uh, the extreme computing power uh, that we have today to, um, uh, you know, to really uh, hurt and, and, and distract other groups uh, and, and governments. Um, but really, it's uh, like, like you said, it's, it's important to uh, really understand all the negative, negative externalities, understanding the carbon foot, the footprints of products that are made, understand the energy uses, and really uh, get a whole snapshot and a whole view of um, uh, how these different uh, products are made and how they're leveraged and the different uh, stakeholders that they're uh, um, that they're uh, affecting and really bringing everyone uh, into the fold, understanding that you know leveraging AI and leveraging advanced manufacturing and these solar panels, how they can help the developing world and you know where they're made uh, is really important to spurring innovation in the the right districts in the U.S. and in the right uh, countries globally. Um, so really leveraging, <clears throat> excuse me, our our understanding um, of who exactly is uh, uh, the stakeholder. Uh, can really help us uh, recalibrate how we leverage these technologies and make sure that uh, you know we benefit as many people as possible and then continue the development of these technologies uh, sustainably in the future. Mm. Fascinating point. Yeah, I really like the idea of, um, well, I should say, understanding stakeholders. Um, last year, I guess, perhaps worth mentioning, uh, we did a summit called Beyond Stakeholder Capitalism. Mm -hmm. Beyond the agenda of just defining stakeholders, because uh, I think then you get into this um, conversation on who is a stakeholder, who is not a stakeholder, uh, and and so you know it, it sort of becomes a game of like who's in and who's not, um, right? So um, and I think it's fascinating. I think our sort of perspective was that. Uh, it has to be, it has to go beyond uh, just defining stakeholders who are sort of human centered uh, and planet centered, which means, um, you know, we're not just looking at human life, but also all life on, on the planet. And uh, I mean, that's, I think, the starting point for sustainability as well, um, because I think the agenda on stakeholder uh, approach has been around for a while, but I think it, it hasn't really done its job in, in building trust, in um, building a common ground for, you know, a conversation, discussion and co-building or what have you. And you kind of see this um, sort of extremes that have, uh, you know, emerged more and more. Um, we we're seeing that earlier, obviously in the U.S., but very quickly started happening in Asia and, and now Europe as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's a little unfortunate. We definitely have a lot of the more... Um, social, political, and geopolitical um, emergencies, I think, um, as well uh, at this point. But I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I continue to kind of, um, you know, uh, <laughs> believe that dialogue is the way to move forward. Um, so with that, class, we'd love to invite you to share your thoughts on um, perhaps you can um, go a little bit deeper into sort of the approaches towards uh, building deep tech because there's the public side, uh, public goods argument where, um, you know, the private sector wouldn't touch something unless it's a given that it's profitable or, or is expected to be. Um, and, and then, you know, of course, there's a more venture capital side of things. So maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. And I, I want to come back also briefly to um, regulation, because regulation can do a few things. It can try to steer technologies in the directions where, where they're most beneficial rather than the, the wrong type of use. But I think also we could re use regulation a lot more to force the introduction of, um, of more sustainable practices. Um, and I'll, I'll just 
one example from uh, a long time ago and, um, and a more recent example that I'm involved in, and then, then I'll talk a bit more about fusion um, because that's where a lot of this comes together in my mind. Um, if you go back uh, 15 years in time, uh, California had mandated zero emission vehicles. Every vehicle manufacturer selling vehicles in California needed to have a zero emission uh, model in their lineup. That really accelerated the development of uh, fuel cells as a technology. Uh, and then in 2007, I think it was when California decided to abandon that goal, that whole industry collapsed because the, the demand was driven by regulation, regulation fell away, and uh, the use case fell away. Um, Zeros, this um, company that works on more sustainable clothing, one of the devices uh, we have developed is a filtration device that filters uh, more than 90% of all microfibers out of the wastewater of a washing machine. Now, just like the car manufacturers uh, will only adopt a, a catalyst when it is uh, prescribed uh, by regulation, the same thing is in, in this industry. This technology is not rocket science, uh, but no one has ever bothered developing it because uh, it was not necessary. And what you see now is that France has legislated for it. The UK has legislation in preparation. California is working on legislation. The EU will probably copy uh, France. Uh, and, and the U.S. might uh, might follow the lead of California here. And what happens is all white goods OEMs are scrambling to find a solution for this. Uh, but this is a, an example of how regulation drives innovation. Coming to, I mean, the word I want to pick up is trust, uh, because I think it is, there is, trust is broken. Uh, and I think politicians have uh, essentially, uh, and, and even the IPCC is, is an example of it, where uh, politics drives uh, science rather than science is, is the objective science it is supposed to be. Um, and what I see in the world of sustainability, in the work, world of carbon, uh, is a lot, a lot of greenwashing that is not regulated for, is tolerated, and, and everyone gets away with it. But the the intrinsic motivation to do something is not there. Um, and I think that is something uh, that is a challenge that we need to break through. And I think regulation is probably one thing, uh, but also the transparency of information uh, is, is very important there. And you're dealing with very complex systems. Coming to fusion. Um, if you look at the challenge we have with the energy transition in front of us in North America and Europe, Demand for electricity will go up by 150%. So it will be two and a half times what it is today by 2050, driven by uh, electrification of, of, of uh, mobility, uh, driven by electrification of heating, and, and driven by simply economic growth. This means that we need to build out our energy system, our energy uh, electricity production system, at double the rate we have been doing for the last decades, for three decades in a row to hit our net zero targets. At the moment, uh, what we're doing in renewables is not even enough to, uh, to, 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 to sustain that growth. So we need to do much more there. And um, sort of the, the analogy, climate is, is a... In, in terms of the potential impact is so much greater than uh, what we've seen with the pandemic. And with the pandemic, which was an urgent crisis rather than a gradual crisis, the world pulled an incredible amount of resources together. There were uh, innovations in, in the way regulation was applied, uh, in the way corporates were indemnified to get vaccines out into the market in record time. If, if we're really serious about climate, uh, we need to do something similar. Uh, we need to throw a lot more money at it. We need to be a lot more creative in how we regulate around it. Uh, and we need to dramatically accelerate the development of the technologies that can uh, can address this. I think all of that needs to come together. Um, and, uh, and, and we've demonstrated with the, the vaccine development that we can do that. Yeah, thank you. I think you really kind of, hit the, the nail on the head there um, with that. And I think um, that has been sort of the 
um, conversation, I guess, in the sustainability community, for the lack of a better term, which I think should be everyone, um, all sorts of, you know, businesses and companies and individuals and what have you, um, on what it's going to take, right? That sort of moonshot thinking. I also like the idea and um, I guess the proposition. Um, one of the hardest things to do is explain also what a complex system is, the fact that it doesn't work like a linear system to then have a base for a conversation on how exponential technologies work and how deep tech works over and beyond, um, you know, kind of what we see in the more day-to-day -day life, if you may, um, you know, people use the internet, but they don't necessarily understand how the internet works. But, you know, again, looking at the applied side of things. So, um, you know, when we're looking at building technologies that are inclusive, we're also looking at different types of humans that come together to 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 build them and in order to do that i think the task of uh, explaining the task of uh, uh you know meeting them perhaps more than uh, halfway is is kind of upon us um so yeah great points there natalie sarv and uh class we have a little less than uh 10 minutes left um in the conversation I'd just love to go maybe around the table here and uh, just kind of hear uh, your final thoughts, uh, just kind of what's top of mind, and maybe just uh, keep it to a minute, minute and a half um, at the very most. Um, and what your what would be your um, um, advice or, or observation uh, to folks who are looking to, um, you know, build careers and, um, you know, uh, join different industries at roughly encompass deep tech? Um, and how do we, uh, yeah, build um, build a more inclusive world um, with technology serving humans and, and not the other way around, I should say. And yeah, the floor is open. Whoever would like to go first? I can start <laughs> um, and be quick. Um, one in terms of the uh, you 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 side of the question on the on the careers um i would strongly um encourage um and um see the need um of the kind of rounded approach to to the deep tech especially the angle of the scaling up of the deep deep tech that is not only focused on on the pure technology development, but also the scale up models and the applications of it. Um, since there is only one one minute for this answer, I won't use the example, um, but there are a number of examples when you t talk to the stakeholders uh, or beyond stakeholders, uh, as was mentioned, um, the technology itself does not fully resonate applications of this technology and how it can impact and uh, and and scale and grow and what it means directly to the stakeholders is what matters and i think we will need lots of skills um, um, uh, from the uh, uh, professionals on this level um, as well creating creating the use cases stories creating the applications uh, of that along the way of uh, technology development. Um, so that, that, that would be my call uh, uh, for action. Love it. I, I really love how you put it. You know, I think it's almost like you turn the, you know, the, the, the problem and the solution the other way, or when that's a challenge, you say, well, that's how, that's how, that's a starting point and take that and uh, run with that. Um, so I love that. I'm going to use it now. Thank you. We call it societal challenges, uh, um, but um, but from the positive standpoint, not not the challenge as the problem, but the challenge as the um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Love it. And and guys like you uh, actually, and 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 your organization also can play a big role in this. You know, the the digital economist uh, of how it's presented and and how how can we engage. You know, professionals and uh, and the audiences in this, that's for sure. Mm, yeah, we definitely have a super human-centered approach, uh, I guess, for, for me, and this is another interjection. Uh, it was life-changing to work with designers. Um, as economists, we just take complexity for granted. We work with it, right? But when you start to explain that to the world, uh, <laughs> 
it gets really hard. And and so when I started working with designers, they were like, wow, we, we can help you say this better. And that was just eye opening. And mm -hmm. it's ever since it's been a very different trajectory. And as long as we're going to engage the investors on that level as well and make them understand that that, that the, the scaling up uh, is just as important and should be invested in uh, and not only the technology itself. So and also the big movers and shakers like uh, uh, Breakthrough Fund, uh, you know, deep tech, great. But <laughs> how are we going to scale it up uh, and how we can scale it up fast, not within the past uh, next uh, 30 years, but uh, within the next 10 years to what Klaus mentioned uh, earlier. I'll Great. stop here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have uh, three minutes left and yeah. we'd love to hear from both of you. And, and, and just to build on that real quick, I think you touched on a lot of great points there and keeping uh, deep tech and the development of deep tech very human centered and human focused, but also uh, really understanding that everything that tech touches, which is every aspect of our lives almost, uh, is going to affect people all over the world, right? So it's not going to be just our uh, local economy or state economy or country economy. We see exactly what's happening, the fight over Twitter and how Uber is servicing uh, consumers all over the world, right? So these corporations and these technologies actually have more reach and more impact than countries or government uh, governments themselves. So really understanding how the development of these technologies is going to affect our planet, uh, people all over the world, people who are in developing countries and develop, uh, the developed world as well, um, really understanding what it means for social governance and, um, and creating more or, or decreasing disparity, um, really taking a systems approach to a, a system uh, style thinking uh, to the development of technologies, I think not only is uh, beneficial for um, uh, the country itself and also expanding the reach of that technology, but uh, in the long term is able to incentivize um, uh, sustainable development because you're going to reach more people, they're going to use your technology more, um, and ultimately um, uh, will mean uh, more adoption of your technology and then hopefully more uh, more profits as well. So um, I, th I definitely think there's a way to coincide uh, with you know the regulations and, and the way these technologies are developed. Um, and I think it takes more systems thinking like the uh, group assembled here and then more broadly at Oasis uh, to really guide the development and sustainable development of these technologies. Two additional comments from my end. I think it's important for people to be on the one hand realistic and on the other hand vote, vote with your feet. So uh, demand for from whatever company you join or whatever organization you join that they uh, address all stakeholders and not just uh, the profit of the owners short term. I think that that's key, but be realistic. Oil will be around for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, it's not realistic to demand that we can simply drop that. So, but, but demand the transition and the commitment to the transition. One thing, the other thing is, um, as an example, our uh, sustainable laundry and, and, and textiles business came out of material sciences. At Fusion, we work with advanced manufacturing, 3D printing. Some of the parts we use were not around five years ago. We couldn't do it. Um, so our education system is very much still in silos. Uh, and I, I think this uh, hybridization, as, as was mentioned earlier, or the cross-disciplinary thinking and the ability to do that, I think is critical because we need to bring all these things together in solutions that work in, in the real world. And those don't come from narrow silences. Those come from understanding both technology and the application domain they, they work in. And, and there are combinations there that we currently don't think about. Mm, interesting. Yeah, really like you, you brought up education there. Uh, so we are actually at time. So right on time. Uh, thank you very much. I, I really enjoy the conversations early morning at the East Coast, but I think this is a good feel for the next few days. Um, and then I hope to uh, chat with all of you uh, sometime soon as well. And I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, and hopefully this leads to uh, synergies and, and hopefully useful to the audiences here as they dive into deep tech. So once again, thank you, everyone. Class, Natalie, and, and Sora for joining today. And uh, I hope to see you sometime. Thank you all. Enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.